Hello and welcome to Meta TV, the YouTube channel of Meta Italia, DM25's Italian party. Uh, we're here today to interview Craig Gent. He is a writer, editor, and researcher. He's the director, uh, a director at Novara Media, where he has worked for over 10 years at this point. And he was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Warwick, and his work has been published in Jacobin, Vice, and The Independent. Craig, thank you so much for being here with us today. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, Tiare. It's great to meet you at last. We are here to discuss Cyberboss, um, your book, which recently came out. And basically, we wanted to start by asking you about the concept of precarity. Uh, you know, reading your book, it kind of made me think maybe this concept is just another one of the many unfortunate ways in which we try to describe or analyze the current context without saying quite simply capitalism, you know, a way of avoiding kind of like the big thing by talking about kind of more minor aspects or symptoms of it. Um, is talking about capitalist control versus a socialist promise of self-determination, power and freedom a more productive discussion. Uh, how do these ideas relate to algorithmic management? It's a good question. I mean, I think that uh, people have begun talking about precariousness over the past, uh, let's say, 20 years or so, since it's become clear that um, the kind of interregnum within capitalism where we kind of had sort of fairly stable institutions but also fairly sort of stable uh, economy with obviously sort of ups and downs and boom and busts but a kind of a, a general kind of um, consensus um, and expectations around for example each generation having a better quality of life than the previous generation and, and so on so i i it has obviously been remarked upon that really precariousness is just a reversion to form for capitalism. Um, I probably locate the fact that we often talk about precarity rather than capitalism in the changes to the way we do politics. And I feel like often politics, whether it's in parties or across unions, has yeah definitely ended up sort of tinkering around the edges more than... Um, uh, more than addressing the problem itself. What I try and do with the book is is get away from um, thinking about uh, precariousness and what I call the precarity preoccupation to a deeper conversation um, or a more fundamental or elemental conversation around freedom and control. Um, because it's my wager that if we just made the conditions better, um, the pay better, the pensions better, the job security better. I still think these um, forms of work would be uh, incredibly injurious to workers who do them. In Cyberboss, you give multiple specific examples of how it is to work at an algorithmic dominated workplace. Can you tell us about the biggest specific differences between this type of jobs and more sort of traditional blue or white color positions? That's a big question. Um, I think what's novel about algorithmic management is the nature of the tracking, the real-time na nature of the tracking. Algorithmic management is a form of management that is backed up with enormous degrees of computational power, which enables computer systems to make very fast decisions involving lots of information in a way that hasn't been available in the past. Um, I don't think it's uh, simply, uh, you know, applicable to just sort of blue collar or, or white collar work. I think we're now seeing it across the board. Um, increasingly, lawyers, for example, are worried about uh, algorithmic management. Um, and algorithmic management has been called the automation of 
of management or, or supervision. Um, but I also think that it reorganizes power in traditionally sort of blue collar workplaces. For example, its use in logistics hubs, for example. Cyberboss is a refreshing text, right? Because it actually goes into detail when discussing both the importance and the limitations of unions, which, you know, we talk about the importance of unionizing all the time, uh, or at least if we are lucky, we do uh, in the in the best possible case scenario. But, um, you know, I think it's fair to wonder where is that uh, the actions taken within unions, where is that sort of not going all that well, maybe? Um, and you do bring up how some um, unions, instead of, you know, understanding struggle from the point of production, seek to uh, get recognition so that they can negotiate with the employer. We were wondering a couple of things, but first of all, uh, is this yet another part of a sort of end of history left politics that prioritizes recognition over power as it's no longer based on class antagonism? I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I, certainly so far, I found it's the most sort of provocative part of the book for many readers on the left. Um, I I mean, look, I, I've always been in the trade union. I've organized in them and, you know, I know how they work and how it is to try and advance demands through trade unions. Um, I also know that some trade unions are better and worse than other others. And I also know that within trade unions, there are reactionaries as well as revolutionaries. Um, so there, there's sort of no one thing. However, I do think it's the case that over the course of the really the 20th century, trade unions have uh, jettisoned um, claims to the organization of work to the detriment of workers. And I think perhaps in an era where what that looked like was, um, you know, sort of reorganizing um, production processes, it maybe felt like it was of a lower stake. But now that the application of technologies to work uh, involves the administration and discipline of labor, uh, suddenly it's very high stakes. And I think a lot of unions are not used to um, to sort of fighting on this front and instead have sort of narrowed their horizon to a struggle around pay and pensions and uh, the terms of employment, for example, which are all important things that's important to do. Um, but it's it's created this very sort of discrete role for unions rather than a sort of maximalist role where unions are able to advocate for workers across all fronts, really. And I think as you identify, um, the particular stumbling block of um, a recognition becomes a real problem for many unions. And it is a stumbling block because even in places like um, the US or in the UK, where we've seen uh, lots of unionization happening around Amazon, for example, which of course the organization itself and the fact of the organization has been historic and that's good and it deserves credit. But if you look at those struggles and where they've ended up, they have often ended up in committee rooms uh, trying to thrash out recognition and their, you know, the momentum is kind of being lost because recognition is seen as the very first thing that has to happen before the, the union can do anything else. Now, of course, that's a political choice. Um, and I think that what I tried to do in the book is expose um, or gesture towards, you know, some of the choices that we, we make sometimes implicitly um, and instead uh, question how they might be otherwise. That's what in Spain, uh, I think we call asistencialismo. So basically very kind of um, similar in a way to how an NGO would work, basically assisting, you know, clients or people they need to help or to save. Um, so yeah, I think that's I think correct. It's, uh, yeah. it's kind of like an advocacy model and right. I think it really posits like a, 
a form of uh, labor struggle like without workers almost um, because instead the struggle is happening in courtrooms or in negotiations and of course those things should happen but if they happen without workers then they can have unintended consequences one example that I, I give is a put side by side the example of a trade union organizer who was very proud of uh, organizing for time and motion studies to be done um, at a logistics hub because in that organizer's view it would give them something to or, uh, to negotiate around but when i spoke to a worker who'd been on the receiving end of time and motion studies it had just left him with a much heavier trolley to push around uh to push around the workplace every day and so i think if these things are not connected to each other it's actually disempowering sometimes what specifically do you regard as the worst shortcomings of unions in the algorithmic management field specifically and do you think despite these shortcomings unions are nevertheless kind of inherently the best vehicle for workers struggle <laughs> these are provocative questions but um Look, I think the worst thing that trade unions can do in relation to algorithmic management is use the phrase, uh, basically, that they want to share the benefit. Um, and you hear this so often. And whether it's that unions are asking for more transparency or explainability is the popular phrase, um, you know, they're often framing their demands in a way where it's very non-oppositional to employers and they're saying we simply want workers to share the benefit of these technologies that's wrong that is wrong that misunderstands why these technologies exist and are introduced to the workplace so fundamentally that it, i think it's actually embarrassing like that 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 is by far the worst mistake that is made and you know like short of that we can obviously have a conversation about other issues such as, you know, okay, we, we'll, maybe we could say, well, if we're saying that transparency or explainability is the thing that we want, even if we imagined that there was, I don't know, some lines of computer code that would explain the power imbalances of the workplace, uh, I don't think we, we need that to, to understand why the power imbalances of the workplace exist. But, you know, we could have a conversation around saying, well, you know, does that not assume uh you know or permit or admit the technologies to the negotiating table before we've even said a word you know that's a conversation we could have but making this kind of gesture towards like sharing the benefit of these technologies technologies that are, are designed and applied to the workplace to injure workers that is really bad i think that's by far the worst thing as to whether Trade unions are, you know, the best vehicle for the changes we want to see. I'm I, like, look, you know, they are the, the vehicles that we have in some sense, but also we don't always have them, you know, like sometimes they do think, you know, we can be in a union and our own union can break our heart, you know, and, and do, you know, we can be in a, in a struggle or a dispute and our union can settle when we want to fight and uh you know i guess the view i take is that you know i do think people should be in their unions and, and so on however i also think it's important not to be overly sentimental um which i think a lot of people on the left often are towards the unions and i think well my interest is in the class and the ability of the working class to struggle and if unions are a part of that that is ideal but if they're not a part of it then we still need to struggle yeah right and it becomes a sort of like almost moralizing idea of like whether you know and i definitely see a lot of people as well who are like anti-union and like basically also kind of based on moral grounds so on both sides there seems to be a sort of mm. like are they nice or are they not nice And it's like, you know, this is not, you're yeah. not about to get married. You're about to pragmatically, like theoretically find the best kind of way to the best venue for class struggle, right? 
Exactly. Exactly. And I'm sure that many, you know, you, me, many of our viewers, like, will have been to a, a union congress or a conference or something and try to, you know, get some position on the table that might make change happen and, you know, see how much of a nightmare, you know, that can be. Um, you know, it's, I don't think that it's that unions are any one thing, but I do also think that there's a battle to be had inside unions and, you know, the... The fact that in some unions, not all of them, but in some unions, you do have a kind of, mm, I'm trying not to use the word establishment, but, you know, there we go. Like, we do have kind of like dominant factions or whatever, um, you know, is often because they're very, you know, amenable to the employers. Um, and I think that could be a problem. Right. They are. Uh, sometimes. <laughs> Next question is about... Um our very own Yanis Varoufakis. Uh, he's, you know, uh, with us at DM25, of course. And he has famously written about techno-feudalism. How far do you believe the digital platforms you discuss in your own book make capitalism unrecognizable? It's a very interesting question. Um, I'm not sure I would say that it makes capitalism unrecognizable i feel like i could i i recognize capitalism within it um but i think certainly like there are changes and i'm always kind of against um this idea of kind of periodizing capitalism in the way that people are often like you know want to do that like they say well we had industrial capitalism and then we had like fordism and then we have post fordism and now we must be into you know, something else. Um, because, you know, in reality, new things get added on and some things get taken away. Job security gets taken away and high degrees of computation get added, for example. Um, and, you know, we still have many industries that are organized around Fordist lines. Um, I'm embarrassed to say this in front of an audience of Italians, but in, in Britain, you know, pre-prepared food is an enormous industry, uh, packaged sandwiches and things like that. And uh, they are, uh, you know, these these industries are organized along perfectly Fordist lines that would not look amiss in the 1930s. Um, so, but I also think it's, it's possible to kind of maybe go uh, the other way too much and say that, well, it's it's just capitalism and nothing ever really fundamentally changes about the wage relation. Because although the wage relation is persistent and, you know, the fundamental class antagonism basis that structures capitalist society is persistent, and I do believe those things, classes change internally in their composition and how they look over time. I think that's important to recognize. The forms of political activity that happen on each side of the, um, of the class struggle uh, uh, morph and change over time and it's also the case of course that the relationship between capitalism and the state and between different geographies uh, changes over time as well so i am perfectly willing to like you know hear that there may be novel aspects of the capitalism that we see presently but i personally would still call it capitalism Something that characterizes digital platforms, or we might say uh, cloud capital, it's, it's sort of international dominance, right? Um, while this kind of, we might call cosmopolitanism, is uh, celebrated by entities such as, for instance, the European Union, Brexit instead heighten questions about the nation, right? Uh, and kind of makes us reflect to this day on how different factions of the left relate to it. Um, so in this context, which relation between the UK, the European Union, and other European nations, working classes, um, do you think would be most in service of the British working class? It's a good question. I think that I am 
I don't know, increasingly old fashioned in that I uh, think that the working classes have no nation. And uh, I think that they also probably don't have uh, an international institution uh, either, such as the EU. I think I'm among friends here and that, you know, I think that, you know, I think that given the discourse around Brexit um, and who was clearly going to, uh, who the people were, who were going to win in that political debate and the way it was fought in this country. Um, I think that, you know, the the wrong people won in that sense. I don't think that a sort of left case for Brexit was, even though it's possible, like, and I do think a left opposition to the European Union is possible, like, it was never articulated um, in this country, unfortunately. Um, and it was, it was quite clear that that was a, a right-wing project. But now I think that rather than kind of uh, thinking about the orientation of the British working class towards either the British government or to the European Union or to other nation states, um, I would like to kind of see uh, a resurgence of internationalism uh, among uh, British and other uh, working class institutions. So in that sense, I'm often more interested in the relationship that workers' organizations in Britain can have with workers' organizations in other parts of Europe and indeed the world. Um, you know, whether it's through uh, research institutes like the EU, uh, ETUI, um, or whether it's through sort of international union initiatives, or whether it's something completely independent. Um, I think that often there's a lot more to be gained from thinking about the the way that um, different struggles can support each other uh, across borders. Also practically, because even at the level of the nation state, and you know, I don't want to deny that it's a factor, but if there are, you know, if there's strong movement uh, and strong labor movements in, in other countries uh, in Europe, and if they win, that has an effect on the movement here as well and people learn from it and it also puts pressure on it's a strange thing you know what happens in in france regarding pensions and you know regarding the french state can have a bigger effect on the the public discourse in britain for example um but yeah i i i, I i'm not sure that the british state or the eu is a natural friend to any of the working classes of of europe i'm afraid Right. So basically you're saying neither the nation nor this sort of like um, institutional bodies are a tool that can be used fundamentally. It's a distraction, we might say, you think? <laughs> well, <laughs> I think maybe they can be used in, in some ways, but we have to sort of recognize them for what they are and also their limitations, right? Like, Clearly, if we want more uh, public kind of initiatives, um, like, for example, uh, like public partnerships for, um, you know, energy, for example, the nation state is able to, con has a sort of convening power um, that could be useful to like a left government, for example. But like, I would always prefer the public and the common over the national, if that makes sense. I'm more interested in public ownership than nationalization. It's a subtle difference, but one I think is important. And alluding to your previous question, of course, you know, even the nation can be relatively powerless to the enormous infrastructural power of big tech companies like Amazon Web Services. Um, so there are always limitations there. But what I do know about Amazon Web Services is that there are workers and the working class at every level of its, you know, delivery and infrastructure. So there should be some opportunities there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that that's very interesting. And I think it would, uh, there would be space for content <laughs> for an entire other conversation on kind of, yeah, uh, public ownership versus nationalization. Uh, that That would be very interesting. But yeah, um, that's, you know, kind of making me 
think about what you think about our last question, because it's actually, um, what do you think is a solution? Like given this situation, given uh, the, the impact of algorithmic management, what do we do? What is, what is to be done? Um, I guess, yeah, like you were saying, you know, workers organizations cooperating internationally, internationalism, but also, yeah, the fact that it's about what works for the class. Uh, what do you think might work for the class? You know, what are some examples or where do you place your hope? Do you have any hope? Well, uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, uh, I think was the, um, the stance articulated by uh, one famous comrade. So I look, I, I think that what I would like to see happen regards algorithmic management, particularly on the left, is a sort of a, um, an AI more broadly is a sort of a, a recognition of like what these technologies are for and what they're about. I think often we get sucked into the kind of myth making that happens around them, which is really on the terms of the tech companies themselves. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, trade unions even come to the negotiating table wanting to share the benefit of the technologies. Um, I would like to see a sort of greater articulation that puts the interests of working class people first, which shouldn't sound radical, but in the present context, kind of does. Um, but I think the most hopeful thing that I've seen in recent years was probably the Writers Guild of America strike in uh, in on the west coast of, of the US, where their demand around sort of AI was essentially suppression because they recognize that in that particular industry, and every industry has its particularities, but in that particular industry, the introduction of AI into the workplace can only be injurious to the workers. Um, and that's a, you know, was the right position to take and they won. And whether they will keep winning on that front in the future, nobody knows, but it at least sets the terms of the debate and uh, means that the starting point in the future will now be on the terrain of that workers institution. Um, which I think is very important. And so whether or not we think in, uh, you know, socialism, there would be, um, or post-capitalism, that there would be algorithmic management or, you know, I mean, artificial intelligence is many things. And in a way, it's just a branding term. But, you know, whether we think those technologies would exist in socialism and whatever we think their role would be, I think first we have to recognize the way that they facilitate uh, capitalism. They don't merely exist within it. They actually facilitate it and they're making it worse for people. And I think some kind of recognition and reckoning with that would be a really important step. And it would be a big one for us to take because I think often we have backed away from struggles around the organization of work. I, I can't think of many left-wing parties that have wanted to involve themselves within how work is organized. Um, and often unions are not uh, are reluctant to do it as well. It's, I think, very interesting how obviously, you know, some automation can be desirable, of course. I think uh, as probably we all do, right, about the home, for instance, uh, especially, you know, even, even from a, from a feminist perspective, I guess, uh, in terms of the, the labor that falls upon women, uh, you know, uh, definitely automation could be so useful on any, on any, on, on so many levels, but not on any, um, as you, as you highlight and as these examples highlight, right? Cause like, obviously creativity should be something so sacred and it's, such a desired kind of meaningful job uh, that we could do that actually so many people want to wanna do in their lives and actually they can't because it's barely paid. Exactly. And I think that the thing is, is that within the writing industry, it's a tool of labor discipline because it, it encourages or maybe even forces people to take up worse conditions, you know. 
Absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's basically like, you know, you're a journalist, just be grateful you are one and don't ask for good conditions on top of that. I mean, wow. Uh, and I, I guess there is something Very to be well said that. about, you know, the fact that, hey, maybe uh, there's also kind of ambiguous class interests in terms of, uh, you know, the downwardly mobile professional managerial class. Uh, and, and, you know, us who, you know, are journalists and like we aim for this, we, we thought we were going to be middle class. But then we're not. Um, so there's a question, I guess, of like, well, then your your big suffering is about not being in the middle class. Um, when actually, yeah, the goal should probably be <laughs> to not have class. But yeah, I guess, again, that's, that also is for a whole other <laughs> conversation. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of media, I would suggest everyone go watch Novara Media. I, I actually, I really love it. I'm a huge fan. And yeah, you guys do amazing work. Um, I also have your book here, Craig. I'm gonna, you know, promote it, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Thank you so and, much. Of course. And it's, it's generally uh, really accessible to read, I would say for sure. Uh, very interesting, I think. Uh, what I what I love about it is that it does focus on like a workplace and you know it it asks questions about class struggle and I think that those are the questions that we should probably be focusing on and yeah and kind of trying to to reach conclusions as to how to how to fight a class war. Um, so yeah, Craig, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And yeah, we, we stay in, in conversation. Thanks everyone for listening to us, for watching us. Please subscribe, please follow us and join us if you want. Thank you. Thank you.